facing a litany of hacking charges across the world. Dylan Wheeler, a kid who'd been hacking since the age of 12, was a fugitive on the run. With a group of teenagers, he had stolen $100 million from Epic Games, Valve, Microsoft, hell, even the US military. And while the other teens were now locked up, Dylan had escaped to Poland, but now he was broke. But from a group of guys he had just met, he had heard the security cameras at the local Polish bank were pretty lax, enough to plan a robbery. At 3 a.m., they lined up at the bank with no one in sight. And as they got inside and Dylan shut down the security system, they loaded up their bags with loot and walked out like it never happened. But as they got home to count their stash and dream of what they could buy, they had failed to realize there was a hidden camera in the wall that had seen it all. And Dylan Wheeler, the infamous kid hacker on the run, was finally caught. What started out as a gang of teenagers hacking their Xboxes to play pirated games for free would spiral down the path of corporate espionage, breaking into the US military, an $18 million FIFA fraud that went unnoticed for years. And it all starts here with the Xbox. Now, people freaked out when the Xbox 360 was released, not because of uh, better games or graphics, but this thing had way better security. Why? Well, because hackers broke the security on the original Xbox, which sprouted a huge community of hackers who modded and exploited and pirated all things Xbox, and Microsoft was pretty pissed. So with the Xbox 360 release, they spent millions of dollars to ensure no one was gonna pirate or mod any game and they actually hailed it as unhackable. And for over four years, the Xbox hacking world just could not break the system, meaning no one can make mods for it until someone found the missing link. At an e-waste recycler, Rowdy was searching for Xbox DVD drives. You know, as a hobby, he'd like to repair them, kind of like a freak. But after an hour of scrounging through the piles of plastic scraps on the floor, his eyes lit up. He had found an Xbox so rare, it actually had no business even being there. The Xbox 360 development kit. Now, this is a huge deal because a dev kit is a special console used to make video games. Microsoft leases them out to developers. So if you're an Xbox hacker, that's what you want. But let me just say, these dev kits are super rare. I mean, you have to provide industry references, resumes, hell, even sign an NDA. And to top it all off, reselling a dev kit is not allowed. But if these are so rare, how did these get here, Vince? Well, the Red Ring of Death. Microsoft Red Ring of Death. The Red Ring of Death, one of the biggest recalls in Xbox history. And while these were all gonna be crushed off, Rowdy gave these dev kits a new home in the hands of some of the most experienced hackers in the Xbox scene. As a child prodigy, David Pecora had been programming since he was in diapers. When his parents got him an original Xbox for Christmas, instead of just playing with it like a normal kid, David made mods for it. But now years later with this unhackable Xbox 360, all he wanted was a dev kit. Because a regular Xbox you just buy at Walmart only runs signed code, which is approved from Microsoft. But a dev kit, oh, that runs unsigned code, which could be anything David wanted. So when Rowdy hit him up with the dev kit for sale, David took all of the savings from his grandma's birthday checks and he got modding his favorite game, Halo 3. Now through the months as the mod got better, he shared his unpolished Halo mods on halomods.com and people were blown away because this meant David had gotten a development kit, which was impossible to get. And of course they asked him, where did he get it from? And how was he doing this? But David was not gonna tell him. Quote, you cannot do it. You won't know how. No one will tell you how. And even with a dev kit, you won't be able to mod. You want a dev kit? Good luck finding one. But Anthony Clark, an 18 year old gifted programmer, knew David was kind of fully. I mean, the kid obviously knew where to get a dev kit. So he hits him up with a little deal. Anthony would help polish his Halo 3 mod in exchange for the number of the guy who sold him that dev kit. So it's a deal. The two agree, they get working on the mod and slowly they become friends talking about girls in school and programming in their Halo 3 mod. That's when David found something on his dev kit that he'd only dreamed of ever finding. PartnerNet. It's where developers test their unreleased games on Xbox Live, meaning there were dozens of unreleased games that they could just play months before anyone else. I mean, for a true gamer, I mean, that's the dream. But PartnerNet isn't open to the world. It's only for licensed developers with the dev kit, and in this case, Anthony and David. To them, it felt like a secret club that they were in. But when developers noticed their unreleased games being played online, they decided to leave the two a little message the next time they logged on. Winners don't break into PartnerNet. But to Anthony and David, this wasn't a big deal. I mean, they were simply just curious about these upcoming games. It was all in the name of fun, right? But outside of stealing games off PartnerNet, the Halo community was amazed with how far their mod had come. Although bummed that no one could even use it because again, no one had a dev kit. 
But that would all change in 2009. In a presentation that rocked Microsoft, two hackers revealed that the Xbox 360 security had finally been broken, the JTAG exploit. With any simple modification, a regular Xbox 360 can have the abilities of a dev kit to run unsigned code, or in other words, mods and piracy for everyone. Within days, thousands of people start JTAGing their Xboxes and Microsoft was just freaking out. Because for Anthony and David, potentially now, anyone could use their mods like Infinite Ammo and Super Jump to cheat online and people pay good money to cheat online. So in a genius move, they sell access to their mod for $100 an hour and kids line up with daddy's Amex ready to max it out. The two start raking in about $8,000 a day, all via PayPal. Remember, these are kids making this kind of money. But for David, making this fast cash just didn't do much to him. According to him, money was just never the motivation. Rather, he craved that high of stealing those unreleased games. It was a feeling that he just couldn't even put a price on. But now everything had been stolen off of the partner net. So to get his hands on even more, David invited more hackers into the group now, the Xbox Underground. At PAX 2010, developers were showing off all of their upcoming games, but just in May, a member of the Underground was on a mission. You see, his Xbox account had been permabanned. He had emailed and called, but with no response back. And without his gamer tag, Justin was a nobody. So with nothing left to lose, he was going to ask the director of Xbox Live to unban him in person. And we have it on video. I actually came to PAX uh, primarily for this panel. Can you unban my gamer tag, please? <laughs> <laughs> no. I played Forza 3 early. I'm sorry, you shouldn't have done that. However, again, but I, I want my account. There are some punishments for which there's sort of no recourse. Yeah, the plan fails. But Justin wasn't just gonna walk away empty handed from PAX. The next day at the convention, Justin was stalking the Atomic Games booth. He had saw the golden shrine on the pedestal a 360 dev kit loaded with their unreleased game. It was a beaut. Atomic had spent over $6 million developing it. And Justin, he was just gonna take it. As they turn around, Justin opens up his laptop, plugs it into the dev kit, but then security starts to walk by and Justin bolts off. And of course they chase right after him, but being a true Xbox gamer, he runs out of breath and they tackle him down. So now with tears in his eyes, he told security it was all a big misunderstanding. It was his Wi-Fi not working and he was uh, connecting to the dev kit to get on the internet. But yeah, the uh, stolen source code was on his laptop. Justin was because Atomic Games works with the FBI. So now this whole matter, yeah, it'd become a national security issue. Within an hour, they raid his home, confiscate all of his Xboxes and charge a kid with receiving stolen trade secrets. But then the rumors come out that when Justin was arrested, he was begging the cops that if he was let go, well, he could name hackers higher up than him who stole way more than just one little game. But yeah, the judge didn't really care. Justin would get the death sentence for a gamer. He got a court order that he was uh, banned from playing his Xbox for 18 months. And now David knew if he was gonna get his hands on more pre-release games, he needed to be a lot quieter about it. Now with David's growing reputation, opportunity started just coming to him. And Super Day, also known as Dylan Wheeler, brought him the opportunity of a lifetime. I've come across a leaked form database with thousands of login credentials. Several emails belonging to Epic Games employees thought we could uh, work together on this. Super day. Now, a lot of people reuse their passwords and hackers know that. Now, it's the biggest reason why leaks like this even happen because of just reused passwords. Now, several emails in this leak were at epicgames.com. So if just one of those employees reused their password, David could enter Epic Games and steal from one of the biggest video game developers in the world. But this kind of seemed too good to be true because who really was Dylan? He said he'd been hacking since the age of 12 and that he went to high school in Australia and that he'd just come out of nowhere with this. I mean, was the kid a fed? But these logins did work, although the minute they logged into Epic Games, there was another problem. These accounts were just the IT support staff at Epic Games, meaning they couldn't see any of these upcoming projects or games, or as Dylan said, what a waste. They just fixed printers and reset passwords. But David's a smart cookie because he thinks, well, we have access to their emails. Let's search for the word password in those emails. And that's when they come across the granddaddy of corporate IT cups, a master password list for every employee at Epic Games, all on a Word document just for anyone to look at and all of this because one employee reused their password. Okay, so my advice, just check to see if your private information's been leaked in a data breach. And right now you can check that using today's sponsor, 
Guardio. Guardio is a browser extension and mobile app that provides real-time protection against threats that thrive in that security gap standard solutions can't even help with. It protects against the latest malware and hijackers that are spread everywhere online. From downloading a game mod to clicking a malicious ad on Facebook disguised as legitimate software, Guardio knows to detect and block them. Now, we already saw that two-factor authentication won't keep us safe if we just happen to download the wrong file. Sophisticated hijackers can bypass two-factor authentication and take over every account you are logged into. But with Guardio's in-house developed methods to detect malicious files, it'll block them before they have any chance to take over your accounts. And with that cross-platform identity monitoring, you'll get real-time alerts when your data has been breached. Once installed, it will run an initial scan that will show you all the threats and data leaks you already have. And then you can continue with the seven-day free trial and remove them and then enable that real-time protection. So go to guard.io slash Vince Vintage, where they're given 20% off the monthly subscription and the ability to protect five people under one Guardio account at no extra cost. And now the crew goes buck wild, infiltrating Epic's network. They check into the CEO, the art director, project lead. Tell they even find a USB drive for the chairman's Lamborghini music loaded with Lady Gaga. But after days of searching, David finally found what he had been looking for. The Mac Daddy of unreleased games. Gears of War 3. This game had been delayed multiple times. Real gamers were dying to play it. But David just couldn't download it. I mean, even with an encrypted Nigerian VPN, it could obviously be traced back to him. What he needed was a hacked modem. Makes it impossible for anyone to track your down and gives you free internet. And while these are normally impossible to get, a member of the underground, Sinet, he had one. At 3 a.m., Sinet downloads the game to a remote server using this hacked modem, but instead of just sending a download link, which again could be tracked, Sinet burns the game onto Blu-rays and he mails them out to the crew. So after all of the hard work and crimes that they had committed, David rips open that package and pops that sucker in and oh my God, the game sucked. It wasn't even playable. But that's when the fear set in for David. Because if this ever got out that they had hacked into Epic Games, yeah, they were looking at some serious prison time. Yeah, the next day, Gears of War 3 was leaked online, and uh, yeah, it made national news. Gears of War 3 was leaked on the web. Epic Games warned people that downloading the title may actually melt your system. Because Epic had spent over $60 million on its production, and Epic promised the public they would find the sick could ever do such a thing. But David just couldn't sleep. I mean, did Epic have any evidence? Were they just gonna pop in and arrest him? And this curiosity drove him into hacking into Epic Games again, where now we found out that uh, the FBI was now involved, but that still doesn't deter David. They continue to stay in Epic's network, knowing that the FBI was in there for months but just to uh, monitor the investigation. And although David put up a strong front to the others behind the scenes, pff, a kid was freaking out. But David's problems only grew. His uh, cheaty mod business that he had with Anthony Clark, yeah, that was getting railed with the cease and desist letters from Game Studio. So the two shut that business down, but they remained pretty close friends. And while David continued on his war path of stealing unreleased games, well, Anthony Clark, he had found his next business opportunity. Now in the FIFA video game, you can earn FIFA coins to build out a better team playing against a computer or humans. But these coins cannot be bought. You have to play games to get coins. But Anthony came across websites that sold FIFA coins for cash. Yeah, they were in China and they did look a little sketch, but you could buy the coins with cash. And it got Anthony thinking, what if he made a bot that could automatically play the FIFA game to earn FIFA coins and then maybe sell them off to these Chinese websites? Genius idea. So as a proof of concept, he spends months developing a tool and oh boy, it worked way better than he even thought. It could play one whole game against the computer within a second, earning him thousands of coins a minute. With just one Xbox development kit running this tool, it made about Anthony 30 bucks an hour, automatically, 24 seven per machine. But then his first week of wholesaling coins out to China, Anthony had made a couple of grand. And of course the business grew. He bought dozens of dev kits, racking up the electricity bill at his house. And while David wanted nothing to do with the FIFA coin business, he referred him out more programmers like Nathan LaRoe, Austin Akala to develop the tool even further. And this business grew. But was this even legal? Now, after a few months of watching every email come through Epic Games, the FBI just stopped emailing their security team because even with the crew still inside of Epic's network, they had no idea who had leaked Gears of War 3. Or in other words, they had gotten away with it. David grew intoxicated by the power he had, leveraging his skills not only for personal gain, but now financial gain. Instead of stealing games for free, oh, he had found a bunch of rich ass gamers who'd pay him the big bucks to steal games for a business. This whole hacking thing, 
yeah, it was a growing, expanding business. Now, if you ever played Fortnite, you've probably heard of Unreal Engine. Now, it's a tool for game developers to build out the worlds and, you know, some of the biggest video games out there. And wouldn't you know it, Unreal Engine is owned by Epic Games, meaning that a uh, master password list for every employee at Epic, yeah, that could be a springboard into hacking into every company in the goddamn world. So with months of meticulous planning, they slipped through the virtual defenses, mainly using reused passwords. They began to break in and steal from every major game developer in the world. Hundreds of companies, thousands of games having total control over their networks, or as uh, David said himself. Uh, are you f Have you been listening? I have to the Australian Department of Defense. <laughs> I have every single big company, Intel, AMD, NVIDIA, any game company you can name, Google, Microsoft, Disney, Warner Brothers. Oh my god, Disney. Everything. But after breaching Microsoft, that's when they uh, stole the secret that had been hidden from the public eye. It was the files for the unreleased Xbox One prototype called the Durango, the source code, the tech specs, all of the assembly instructions for a group of Xbox hackers having the next gen Xbox documents. Yeah, that's like the craziest thing ever. And they decided they were gonna build a counterfeit of it. Now it probably sounds insane, but a Durango or Xbox One is just off the shelf parts like a computer. So using those documents they stole as a build guide, they put together a counterfeit Durango and they just stare at it because there was no games for it. So Austin Akala thinks, maybe we can sell this, you know, to make some money off of that Microsoft hack, but not on eBay. That would bring way too much heat. So Austin builds out the Durango and they find a dude in West Africa who pays him five grand for this counterfeit Durango. And then all of a sudden, after talking to no one for two years, Justin May shows up and he's back in the crew. And he offers to ship it out because quote, I can get a good deal on shipping and the crew lets him. But the Durango would never even arrive because the uh, buyer in West Africa, that was the FBI. Now, Dylan Wheeler was the kid who just always had to be right. And now with the secret knowledge of the Xbox One, he argued all day in the forums about what it would be and what it looked like, but no one believed him. And this pissed off Dylan Wheeler so much. So he ends up leaking all of the stolen documents from Microsoft and hell even puts his Twitter handle in it. That'll show him he thinks. But then behind everyone's backs, that's still not enough. He puts the Durango on eBay. And of course the news picks it up. They got a Durango on eBay. They got the documents all leaked. It's one of Microsoft's biggest leaks in years. And although the crew was freaking out over this attention, Dylan just loved it. He was doing interviews as the Xbox leak kid. What was the whole purpose of you leaking out information about Durango? To Microsoft, it was a purpose of this is what can happen if you don't fix these problems. This wasn't malicious. But it's still not enough. Dylan wants games for his Durango. So he starts hacking into more video game companies by himself to find more upcoming games. But he finds something even better. Zombie Studios has a direct VPN connection to uh, the US military. Maybe they were making a game, he thought. So he gets in the network and instead of some stupid Xbox game, oh, we find something even crazier. The training simulator for the AH-64D Apache helicopter. And he thinks, maybe I could sell it to the Arabs. So he commits espionage and steals a half a million lines of code. And he just could not wait to tell David. I mean, that's the ultimate unreleased game, right? Oh, but David was livid, stating, how the f are we even supposed to play this? You're an idiot. The Arabs already have Apache helicopters. So why the f would they need a simulator? Get the hell out of here, man. You're done. But Dylan's problems were just only beginning. At the age of 17, Dylan Wheeler had Microsoft investigator Miles Hawks in his living room. Now he had flown all the way out to Australia just to ask Dylan, how did he get all these Durango documents? And Dylan just tells him everything that he hacked into Microsoft with a team of experts that he was the leader of. And it was all because he was a curious little boy. But that whole uh, putting the Durango on eBay, that was just a big joke, lighten up, buddy. So Miles lets him off with a little warning. Stop hacking Microsoft, stop posting Durango stuff on eBay, and we're all good. The next day, Dylan puts the Durango on eBay and uh, Microsoft shuts down the listing and Bill Gates calls in a little raid from the Australian Popo. They bust in through his house and oh boy, they find evidence of hacking into the US military, hundreds of game developers, and that he had hosted servers with child content on it. 
which that detail gets left out a lot. So now Dylan's facing 22 felony charges, waiting trial, out on bail, but it even gets dumber. He does an interview with Kotaku Magazine where he just tells the world that he had hacked into every game developer, but it wasn't just to make money. No, 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 it was just because he was a curious little boy. Uh, the interview is linked down below and it's uh, pretty funny. Even the reporter doesn't believe him. Oh, and uh, all of that child stuff? Again, that wasn't him. That was just the other hackers in the Xbox Underground who had also been now been raided by the feds, except for David. Now, while David's crew was just falling apart, Anthony Clark's business was growing like a startup. Their production increased to 1 million FIFA coins a second. Anthony hired programmers, accountants, attorneys, hell, even formed an LLC. In just eight months, Anthony made over $7 million. He bought this house, he bought a Mercedes, his coworkers bought Lamborghinis, all from FIFA coins. But the money hadn't come that easy. Well, at first, the FIFA game had no security. They had now added in CAPTCHAs to prevent the bots that they were now using. But again, no problem. They just developed bots to do the CAPTCHAs. But the real question was, was this even legal? Now, the coins weren't stolen or hacked from FIFA. It was just a bot that played hundreds of games a second, you know, to get FIFA coins that, again, couldn't be bought. I mean, in their own terms of service, it says the coins have no value, mainly for tax reasons. So how could it be fraud? Now, months after the raid of others in the crew, David received the message from Armand the Cyber with an opportunity. Now, Armand had stolen a real Durango from Microsoft's headquarters. He had a family friend that worked there and he cloned his employee badge and just dressed up like a dork and walked in their headquarters and just took it. And he told David it was so easy that he'd be willing to do it again to get David his own Durango in exchange, of course, for a couple of grand. Now, to me, this guy seems like a total fed, but to David, it seemed like a great idea. So he went through with it. So wearing his Bill Gates deluxe uniform and his fake badge, Armand gets in. Now he had heard the Durangos were on the fifth floor, but his badge didn't have that security clearance to get him there. So, you know, at America's most technologically advanced company on earth, he bypasses all of their security by taking the stairs. And he shoves two Durangos in his backpack, walks out like nothing ever happened. Bam, 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 mission accomplished. Yeah, the next week, Armand gets a call from Microsoft headquarters. They wanted him to come down to their offices to have a little chat with them because, uh, Armand had gotten hired there. And that's when he remembered, oh my God, I put in my job application last month. So David's got a Durango, Armand's got a new job, and they lived happily ever. It was actually all a trap to bring Armand to Microsoft's interrogation room. They had it all on cameras, and Armand confesses to everything. Now they tell Armand that Microsoft would not press any charges if he could just bring the Durangos back, or else things would get nasty. Armand calls David freaking out, saying how f would it be if they didn't get these Durangos back? I'll give them all this money. Just send the Durango back, anything. But David just stops picking up his calls because this was their mom's problem, not his. Pulling up to the U.S. border, David and his father told customs that they were just driving to the U.S. to run a real quick errand. But after just one glance of David's face, they ask him to get out of the car and they put him in handcuffs. And they tell his dad that David would not be coming home for a very long time. For the last eight months, the FBI had a secret indictment listing David Pakora as the first foreign hacker to be charged criminally in the United States. Why? Stealing over a hundred million dollars in American trade secrets. Now, along with David was Sinet, Austin Akala, and Nathan LaRoe were all arrested and charged as co-conspirators. Now, all four would plead guilty to stealing over a hundred million dollars in trade secrets with Nathan, Sinet, and David all getting prison time, except for Austin Akala. The FBI had found something very interesting on his computer. Now, while Anthony Clark had been David's business partner in the past, he never got caught up into this case. He didn't steal games, he just mined FIFA coins. But when the FBI found evidence on Austin Akala's computer of this FIFA coin mining operation that made millions of dollars, yeah, that's who they went after next. On September 2015, Anthony Clark and his three employees who were separate from the crew were raided from the IRS where they seized over $4 million in assets because Anthony's little business, yeah, that had made him over $18 million in a couple of years. But the problem started when he was withdrawing up to $30,000 a day from his 13 personal bank accounts because those uh, glitched FIFA coins he made, while he did sell them to China and hell even paid his taxes on them, the government said it was all wire fraud. 
Now, Anthony's three partners, who also made millions from this, did a plea deal to give up all of the money they made in exchange for absolutely no jail time. Because, you know, if the FBI brings a case against you, there's a 99% chance that they're gonna win. But Anthony truly felt he was innocent. His attorneys thought they could win a case at trial because again, these FIFA coins couldn't be bought from EA. He didn't hack in, he didn't steal the coins. So how could you commit wire fraud for something that's free? But when the prosecutor said, if this was not money nor property they were obtaining, then what were they getting paid $16 million for? That's when the jury found Anthony Clark guilty of conspiracy to commit wire fraud. So pleading innocent the 22 charges, Dylan Wheeler had 48 hours to hand in his passport to the Australian police. But instead, his mom just drives him to the airport and then he hops on a flight and he leaves the country to the Czech Republic. All because Dylan had dual citizenship there and he couldn't be extradited back, he was now a free man. Now, instead of just laying low as a fugitive on the run, Dylan does interviews with the news. To be honest, it's quite scary that I was able to leave, to leave on my Australian passport because they have a system that they use at border control to find out if you're a criminal, if you're, a fug if you're trying to leave the country, um, and it'll flag you normally. Australia would arrest his mom after he said that and even sentence her to two years in prison because technically, you know, she was harboring a fugitive when she uh, drove him to the airport. Now Dylan Wheeler's alone in the Czech Republic, his mom's locked up, he's got no money. So he gets a job at a cybersecurity firm, you know, that specializes in banks. Dylan did interviews saying he's a reformed hacker, he's a good boy now. But a week later, customers at these banks began complaining that, uh, Hundreds of thousands of dollars were getting transferred onto the debit card of an Australian citizen. Who could that be? Oh, Dylan Wheeler. So the Czech police raid his apartment. Oh, and they find he's counterfeiting money now. So he pleads guilty in the Czech Republic and then he only gets probation. And then he flees off to England. Now, while in England, he starts his own cybersecurity firm called The Day After Exploit. You know, he's giving interviews, he's doing security conference presentations, but then in October of 2020, his business dissolves. His Twitter shuts down. He deactivates his website. There is not a trace of him past October 2020. So I got a hold of one of Dylan's old co-workers and they said he had left England and was actually living in Poland, but not for what you think. Because there he had decided to rob a Polish bank with two random dudes he just met at a bar. But then the whole thing was caught on hidden camera. So the next day Dylan Wheeler's arrested and today, he sits in a Polish prison with a 10 year sentence for robbing a bank. Now the week before his sentencing out on bail, Anthony was out for his birthday and he partied so hard with his friends. And after that final round of shots, hugging all of his friends goodbye, Anthony went to bed knowing that his friends and family really did have his back. But sadly, he wouldn't wake up the next day. His mom found him not breathing. The coroner would rule an accidental drug overdose from mixing the Vicodin and the alcohol. There was no note left behind. He never talked about doing this on purpose. It was all an accident. He had so much to offer to the world from such a young age. He was such a talented programmer. And to just see it all be ended like this, it's really a tragic story. But for the others like David, Sinead, and Austin Akala, today they have thriving careers as programmers, cryptographers, some even have families of their own. And while I did contact them for their side of this story, all of them refused to comment.